Uh, so my name is Matthew Sherman, and I want to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar with the Accreditation Council for Medical Affairs for the ACMA. Uh, today's title is Setting New Benchmarks, Trends and, and Standards in Medical Affairs and MSL Organizations. This is an exciting webinar topic as medical affairs in the MSL role continue to rapidly evolve. I'd like to start today's webinar by introducing your speaker, speaker panelists for today. So first and foremost, I have Dr. Mina Boulis, who is the Executive Director of U.S. Medical Affairs at Decatur. He began in field medical and progressed to leadership roles in medical strategy at top pharmaceutical companies. Dr. Boulis is an accomplished author, a respected reviewer for peer-reviewed journals, and serves on the, ethic, on the Ethics Committee of the American Gastroenterological Association, or the AGA, while holding a trustee position as well on the board of American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, or the ASGE Foundation. So welcome, Dr. Bullis. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Panak Joshi, or PJ, who is the medical director at Organox. PJ trained as a clinical pathologist and has worked as a medical affairs leader at the National Cancer Institute, Vectors Capital, and CareDX. Third, we have Dr. William Solomon, founder and CEO of the Accreditation Council for Medical Affairs, ACMA. Uh, he is often featured in media such as uh, Fox News, Forbes, Al Jazeera, Yahoo Business TV, and ABC News Radio. Dr. Solomon earned his bachelor's from New York University and his PhD from Columbia University. So welcome. Uh, finally, we have pleased to announce uh, Dr. Afsha Alam, who is joining us as a, as a medical affair lead at Gilead Sciences. She uh, trained as a pharmacist. Uh, and works now as a YouTuber and influencer as well to help foreign graduate pharmacy students pass the licensure exams in the United States through her YouTube channel and online courses. And with that, thank you for all of our panelists for joining us today. And with that, I'll try to give like an overview. So right now, the current state of medical affairs, um, greater visibility means increased scrutiny. Um, so right now, I mean, when the FDA does an audit, the first thing that they look to is the MSL and Medifairs uh, teams. Ultimately, because they want to make sure that they're being compliant. Um, you know, ultimately, there's a lot more at stake whenever it comes to the, the dissemination of information on the rise with more medical affairs leaders <clears throat> taking charge of talking to KOLs. Um, and right now, like more than ever, you have to deal with market access, R&D, clinical, uh, and the sales and marketing team all goes in and around medical affairs, um, you know, connecting both R&D and the marketing uh, to make sure that everyone is compliant in that. Uh, so right now, Metaferis has really ingrown, uh, has really grown increasingly complex. Um, not only are you dealing with, uh, you know, KOLs anymore, now like you have a lot more external and, and internal stakeholders, whether that be payers, uh, you know, organizations in the community, regulators, uh, HDPs, uh, you know, that aren't just doctors, but uh, pharmacists uh, and nurses now, uh, and obviously patient advocacy groups and, uh, you know, hospital systems as well. So thinking about all of this, you have to really deal with not just your doctors, but now you need to deal with all of your uh, potential community and stakeholders at risk, uh, you know, at not knowing the right information. So it's growing increasingly complex and we have to make sure that we fit and meet that need. Uh, so right now, like there's a, as you see right here, here's a medical affairs matrix. You know, as you can see, like you have different uh, franchise and product, and product strategy leaders that then like intertwine between different uh, features of, of the medical affairs community, whether that be med info, med communications, evidence generation, insights management, just to show you how large medical affairs really is and, and who they interact with, you know, just to kind of give you like a visual. First okay. one achievement is, is huge in medical affairs, you know, ultimately like I already kind of spoke on the compliance risk, uh, you know, I mean, obviously uh, that's a huge, you want to make sure that you're covered with compliance and you, you want to make sure that you're very transparent and you know make sure that you have like certain standards um and functionalities in place and then uh obviously re relational risks you, you want to make sure that your team is encouraged and because the turnover rate is very high with the msl role especially but obviously you want to have that that credibility for your team you want to invest in your team you want to make sure that they feel confident enough in your organization and your work culture to make sure that they, uh, you know, are able to to live up to a very high expectation to meet this very complex and demanding uh, industry, and then obviously one of the large things that you know everyone should be worried about is the risk of underachievement, uh, the risk of underachievement causing 
ineffectiveness. Many times you only get one meeting with a KOL and you want to make sure that you make that impression, right? Because the number one uh, predictor of an effective drug launch is having a very effective medical affairs team, right? So you want to make sure that you're representing the right data, you're promoting the right uh, data within the trials, um, and that you're sticking to what you can and cannot say um, based on regulations given to us by the FDA or your other governing bodies. Um, right now, there's a huge medical affairs uh, social responsibility to the patient as well, right? So you deal with things like uh, health outcomes, societal values, your corporate reputation, and ultimately sustainability and increased awareness. No longer is it one dimensional, right? You're no longer just talking to the doctor. You're talking to multiple stakeholders. And on top of that, you have a fiduciary concern to ultimately make your patient's life better and society better as well. So you want to focus on things like sustainability, being inclusive, having diversity in, in your clinical trials, and ultimately increasing health, health outcomes for the entirety of the population. Um, and in being able to have that data is very important. And then I'm not sure if you want to add anything else to that, Will, before we kind of jump into our questions. Uh, but yeah, feel free to do No, I think, I think you covered it really well. I think, you know, ultimately there's, again, more scrutiny, more visibility. It's more complex matrix. And we have a greater social responsibility. So I think that really sets the stage for the types of benchmarks and standards we need in medical affairs. So no, thank you. Yeah, thanks for including that. Um, so just to kind of jump into our questions to involve more members of our panel um, here. So... The first question I have is actually for Afsha. Um, what are the emerging trends that you're seeing in the pharmaceutical industry today? Why, well, thank you for that question. Very good question, by the way, Matthew. So the emerging trends, as I think, would be personalized medicine, as you may already know of, as precision medicines with targeted therapies designed to a specific patient's genetics. I think it's going to boom in 2023 and in the upcoming year 2024, where pharma companies can use AI and uh, machine learning to adopt precision medicine and then um, develop targeted therapies, which is customized to patients' genetics. So that is one thing. Second, I think that would be digital health. So mm -hmm. categories like mobile health devices and wearable devices are going to help patients make more informed decisions about their health. And I, I also think that it's going to help um, in the prevention of um, life-threatening diseases and also help in the early diagnosis of life-threatening diseases. So that is the second thing. And thirdly, I think AI, of course, last but not least, uh, AI and machine learning would be adopted by pharmaceutical companies in 2023 and in the upcoming year of 2024. And we can gain more market insights. It can help us develop sales strategies, design clinical trials properly, and stuff like that. So I think these would be the three main categories and three main trends that are going to emerge in 2024 and 2023. Thank you for that insight. Yeah, I completely agree. And you know, just to piggyback off that data right now is you know today's currency. It's so important. Um, especially in pharma. Um, my second question here is, Mina, what do you think are some of the implications of medical affairs and MSLs not meeting the needs for emerging trends in the industry? What do you think are the implications of underachievement in medical affairs? Thanks for the question, Matthew. Um, so two really good questions. I think just briefly, I, failing to meet uh, the, the needs and, and trends set in the pharmaceutical industry, which is a very dynamic and ever so changing industry, that we have to cope with, um, especially for our medical strategy and field medical uh, affairs uh, colleagues at the MSL rules. Um, this can have a significant impact if you don't meet uh, the, the needs and the trends that are currently in place and that are evolving. Uh, may result in a missed opportunity uh, for innovation. Um, as, as Afsha just mentioned, from a digital health and an AI perspective, that's ever so changing and will continuously uh, be in an evolving state. So we wanna stay at the forefront of innovation um, it may delay drug development or conversations around drug development. It may decrease your ability to stay in the forefront of scientific discussions. Um, and it may lead to eventually a loss of trust within the stakeholders. And, and from a medical affairs perspective, really industry-wide, uh, I, I could say, is developing that sort of trust, trustful relationship with your stakeholders. To your second question, I think underachievement in medical affairs is just the continuation, right? It's 
um, it can hinder the, the the scientific communication that you have with your HCPs. As you mentioned earlier, uh, it's not one dimensional anymore. It's your doctors, your allied professionals, uh, your NPs, PAs, um, and and all the core and essential uh, folks that take care of our patients. So if we lose the ability to effectively communicate, that may impact our, our scientific credibility and the company's credibility. And there's also a risk of, of non-compliance um, and the ability to comp- to navigate uh, the complex situations and complex regulatory landscapes. Everyone's point earlier, um, it's a very highly regulated environment. So you wanna stay at the forefront of making sure that we are compliant in how we interact. Thank you for that very thorough answer. That- you know, that was some very helpful indeed. Thank you, thank you for covering that. Um, my third question here is for PJ. Um, what are some of the ways that you think medical affairs or MSLs can help prepare for this transformational time in uh, in medical affairs in the MSL role? Yeah, absolutely, thanks, Matt. Um, well, lots of thoughts here. Number one, um, I'm seeing personally through my experience with, you know, different companies that I've worked in that the knowledge base and the clinical expertise of medical professionals working medical affairs is increasing at an exponential rate. You know, no longer are folks coming in with, you know, just a bachelor's or a master's and jumping into, into their first industry role. We're getting folks like myself, folks like Mino, who are, you know, have, have tons of clinical experience and get, getting right into, um, uh, you know, the field medical affairs roles or, or, or otherwise. And I think that's a bo- both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because you know we're able to communicate really well with our clinical colleagues because we were in their shoes yesterday. It's a curse because going back to Mina's point, um, we really have to understand what the lines in the sand are with regards to compliance and what can we communicate with our HCPs on the ground and what information can we not and we have to be more careful about so in order to you know make sure that our field personnel and really everybody in medical affairs is is well aware of this and is well trained um, i think it's really important to understand our roles and i think this is such an understated part of working in industry i think people you know tend to just kind of jump in with both feet without fully understanding where what is my role what is my responsibility within this organization and and industry as a whole so really educating ourselves and um, like all of all of you have said um, you know keeping abreast of all of the changes that happen in medical affairs this isn't a stagnant industry it changes quickly fba regulations change as well we need to be on top of it we need to you know constantly be um, vigilant of those changes yeah, thank you for mentioning that. It's, it's certainly so much you need to keep track of nowadays, especially with this ever-changing landscape. William, I was wondering to see if, if you could also provide some thoughts on this uh, and kind of give your perspective as well. Yeah, so, you know, I think one of the challenges um, that all medical affairs professionals really are facing is that the landscape is not only changing when it comes to what's happening externally, but internally, right? So there is a need for medical affairs and MSL professionals to have a much broader skill set than ever before. So they need to be able to navigate what's happening on the digital front. You know, at the ACMA, one of the things that we've been doing over the last year is working with companies and supporting them with our AI tools. And it's really been an eye opener to see that a lot of companies aren't prepared for that. They're not really prepared for how they're going to implement AI, how they're going to implement these tools and integrate them with their current systems and solutions. That's just one one example. Right. So what's happening on the digital side? Another another example, I would say, is understanding this intercalation between, you know, therapeutics in the traditional sense with devices and pharmacogenomics and diagnostics and how that all kind of goes together hand in hand. So again, it's really uh, having professionals that just have a broader skill set, not just relying obviously on what the traditional training is clinically, but what else they need to really be effective. Because the truth is nowadays, the information's at your fingertips, right? Um, You can get access to information very quickly nowadays, and that's a great thing. But what it means really is that if you're Uh, in medical affairs, if you're a medical science liaison and you're out there talking to external experts or key opinion leaders, how are you going to bring value? How are you going to make it so that 
it's worth their time to sit down and spend the hour with you. Um, that's really, you know, for me, at least personally, uh, when I was in medical affairs and I, and I'd done all these different types of roles, that was always a challenge, right? Is like, how are you going to, you know, earn their time and earn their time to come back? So I think that's going to be the big thing in the next 10 to 15 years is, is your organization within medical affairs, is your field medical team really prime time and ready for what's happening? And I, and the last thing I would add is post opioid crisis post opioid crisis because things are different now after the opioid crisis you know again going back to what i was saying earlier we've had a lot of discussions on the hill with what happens you know from the government side and how they see medical affairs and and things are different now right people now they view the pharmaceutical industry a little bit differently so um like you were saying matthew in the slides we uh, within medical affairs and as, and as an industry as a whole have a responsibility socially yeah to do what's right for society so i think there's that element as well so there's a lot of different factors there so i think today's msl or medical first professional really needs to have that holistic kind of 360 degree view thank you for that input i mean kind of talking about you know a broader skill set and being ready um to engage in, in this landscape uh afsha i understand that you know you are a bcmas grad can you tell us a little bit more about the bcmas program um and like kind of like what it is and, and kind of how it's impacted you? Yes, sure, Matthew. So as Will uh, mentioned about the diversity of the skill set, I believe it's an excellent program. And now that I've gone through it, I mean, the outer picture of the program looks like it's only designed for medical affairs and medical science license, but that's really not the case. They have stuff like medical writing that teach you how to give presentations. They have compliance stuff in it. They also teach you clinical trial designs, which is like top-notch, up-to-date information. So as Will mentioned, it's really important in today's age, after the opioid crisis, to like stay up-to-date and have that skill set. I believe BCMS is the course um, that's going to provide you with that. And because I've gone through it, I was just blown by the amount of information that it it has in it. I mean, after working for so many years in medical affairs now, the outer picture looks like, oh, I don't need that course because I have worked for all these years in medical affairs and I know everything about it, but that's really not the case. I mean, after going through this program, going um, to all the modules that are there, I was I came across information that I even didn't know existed. So that is a win-win. Secondly, I was able to connect with so many industry experts who have gone through the program who are also BCMS certified. So from a networking point of view, it's it's a win-win again. And then last, um, I was, I mean, this is a point that I would like to mention here. And uh, Will, you can intervene if you would like to. I was contacted by so many recruiters. I mean, I don't know if this is just a personal experience or everybody who has gone through BCMS and experienced this, but I was contacted through um, different channels from a number of recruiters who had open petitions and offering to me. And I've all, I also believe that ACMA is working with top-notch recruiters now um, for the people who are enrolled in their BCMS program to help them secure successful positions within the industry. Right, Phil? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was actually contacted by a lot of recruiters as well. I might leave the ACMA. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to scare my team. No, but in all in all seriousness, um, it, it's 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 of course BCMS. We know, and we have data. Actually, there's data coming out. It's going to be published in the next three weeks. BCMS professionals, you know, and again for those that are on the line that aren't familiar with BCMS, it's Board Certified Medical Affairs Specialist Program. There's actually data that's just come out. Um, it's going to be published in Pharmacy Times that if you have a board certification in medical affairs, you actually make more money now on average than, than, than your peer. But I think it's it's more than that, right? That's great and it's great that BCMS can do that and help people's careers, that's fantastic. But I think ultimately really the goal is that by implementing board certification in an organization for your team and accreditation, you're providing really a framework to minimize variation and to set standards. And if you look at every other industry that's out there, that's what we do. Right, that's what we do. It, whether you're working in the restaurant business, there's certain health standards. If you're a CPA to do your taxes, you've got to be certified, right? It's a certified public account. And I can go on and on. Um, within our industry, you know, until the ACMA came into existence, we, we really didn't have that. 
So having those standards in place is so, so, so important. One of the, um, I don't know if you guys had a chance to watch this, uh, the show on Netflix about the opioid crisis. Actually, no, it was on Hulu. There was one, there's one on Hulu, there's one on, on Netflix. The one on Netflix is Painkillers. If you haven't watched it, it's great with Matthew Broderick. There's one, though, on Hulu. It's called Dope Sick, if you haven't seen it. And there's a scene there, and everybody on this call is going to appreciate that because we're all, you know, PharmDs, MDs, PhDs, right? And we always look at data. There's a scene there where the company is showing the data, but the way the data is being showed is a bit skewed on the graph, right, where they're kind of showing the, the uh, potential addiction uh, of OxyContin. And, and it's interesting because I can tell you myself, when I was in the industry, oftentimes if you, if you weren't really good at interpreting data and evidence and understand biostatistics and clinical design, if the data was presented to you in a certain way, you may not recognize that that data maybe is skewed or biased. So it is really, you, you have to know it yourself as the individual there so you understand how to make sense of it clinically or scientifically. Um, I have another story, real, just real quick, if you don't mind, Matthew, where there was you know, a situation where I came into a position and we, we, we knew we had to design a clinical trial because this drug that we had was used in combination with another drug already on the market. All right, so another drug drugs on the market, it's already be, being used. Now our drug's gotten approved and people, the physicians are gonna use it in combination. And people within medical affairs, didn't, they weren't sure really of how to design the study. They, they didn't understand clinical design principles. And there's a lot of examples like that. So that's why I'm, I'm really a big, 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 big proponent of setting standards because what we do is so important. We're educating physicians. Remember the average, MSL gets about an hour with a doctor versus a, a rep who only gets a few minutes. So I think it behooves us to really make sure that we have certain standards and, and a framework in place. So that's really, for me at least, personally what it's about. Thank you for providing more background on the BCMAS program and some of the you know topics that do exist in the program today that are so important. Um, being able to understand and interpret data in medical affairs it is essential um, to be very effective. Um, PJ, just to follow up, can you tell us about, uh, you know, from your perspective, how BCMAS can benefit professionals in the industry? I understand you're also a BCMAS grad. I am. I'm also a proud BCMAS graduate. And wow, how can I follow that? That, that, uh, <laughs> that Well, that's, that's so much. I, I was going to say all those things. Well, you said the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> but, um, but no, in all seriousness, um, there's, the, well, first off, the BCMAS program for, for me had a lot of just obvious benefits when I was trying to just explore industry and see where I could find the best fit for myself. Like Afshar mentioned, it's a very broad program, right? So it gives you a window into all different facets of medical affairs and, and medical affairs in itself is such a vast landscape that it's important to know where, where you can best bring your skills into play. So that's, that's one. Credibility and networking is number two. I heard of the BCMAS just on LinkedIn and, and seeing other medical affairs leaders and seeing these letters behind their name and just having a coffee chat and seeing, oh, okay, this is what this is about. You know what I mean? Um, uh, what really drew me to the ACMA was that uh, uh, it's a, this is not a walk in the park kind of a credential program, right? Uh, you know, we had to take a nice three hour exam after afterwards, a nice proctor three hour exam as the Afsha smiling there. I'm sure Mina smiling on the inside. Um, it was definitely a, a tough exam to get done. Uh, it took a lot of studying, right? So it, 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 that's, it's such a good thing, right? It shows that you really know inside and out, you know, everything that you all mentioned from clinical trial design to really understanding um, A to B and how to uh, function well as a medical affairs expert. And um, last but not least, I think it gave me the right compass to work ethically within an organization. And I think that is so powerful and so important. Um, in these um, companies, you know, we are the voice of reason. We are the ethical compass of that company, and we need to be vocal about that. And, um, you know, the BCMS really helped me um, find out what is right, what is wrong, and how do I kind of navigate that as a professional on the inside. Yeah, thank you for kind of highlighting some of the tools that it's able to give you. I feel like that's so important to kind of conceptualize that. Um, so thank you for that pers you know, perspective. That did add to the conversation. Don't don't get me wrong. Will's response was good, but I, I also enjoyed hearing from you. Um, yeah, that was that was great, Pinnock. Yeah, it was great. I always love hearing from everyone's perspective. Um, now, Mina, what do you think are some of the challenges companies face in level setting the skills for medical affairs and MSL organizations? Well, I 
<clears throat> Thanks for the question. I think it, it goes back to the um, dynamic and ever evolving industry that we're, we're in. Um, to Will's point, I think you said this earlier, is that you need a broader set of skills, right? So a diverse set of skills are required to really hone in and be effective. Um, there is a number of challenges. I mean, entering the pharmaceutical industry or even medical affairs from uh, an MD, a PhD, a PharmD background, it's a pretty steep learning curve, right? I mean, we all are blessed to read science pretty quickly and interpret it, as, as Will had mentioned, um, and know the ins and outs on, on how to read a paper. Um, and how to analyze the data, but y y there's going to be challenges because everyone is unique, right? The the, the skill set that I bring or that I walk in with is going to be totally heterogeneous from what PJ brings or Afsha. Um, and so challenges include, you know, consistency in terms of training across teams. We want to make sure that uh, there's a standard approach on the science that we know because we're going to be effective communicators. So we need to be saying uh, and understanding the same thing. Um, we need to also adapt to new um, technology. So back to Afsha's earlier point on AI and, and digital health and even telemedicine, how does that impact our day to day? So we want to make sure that, um, you know, we can overcome any challenges by adapting new technologies. Don't get me wrong. Technology is fantastic. However, there's technology being thrown at us every day, every second, everything pops up in, you know, in your browser you're like, what is good? What is not? And what will make me be more effective and bring value in what I do? So it, it's very important that um, we address that as, as an organization and as uh, professionals to know what's good for us and for our team members. And then the regulatory challenges. Someone who hasn't been in the industry before, um, understanding that this is a very highly regulated environment and people don't just say that it's important to know who your compliance folks are and your ethics folks at, at your company. Don't be afraid to raise your hand and, and ask them questions because that'll keep you out of trouble, keep the company out of trouble for that yep, matter. Yep. Um, and then aligning you know, skills with uh, the therapeutic area, right? Uh, I think being a specialist in a specific therapeutic area is fantastic, but being a medical affairs specialist across the board so that you can adapt to the different sciences and the disease states is also very important. Uh, I think other challenges is, is just recognizing that cross collaboration is, is very important um, for people entering and consistently, even the veterans and the seasoned folks that are in the pharmaceutical industry. Can you continuously collaborate with your internal stakeholders as well as your external stakeholders? These are some challenges, but you know, very uh, good challenges to overcome and put, uh, put some strategy to. Matthew, you know, I see some really good questions here from the audience, and I just want to make sure we get to them. Uh, one question that I think is really important, Michelle asks, how does one mitigate the negative perception that the BIPOC community has about clinicians and what training is being offered in your MSL program to address this? Um, so I think this is actually a very, very good question, and I'm glad you brought it up, Michelle, because we actually at the ACMA have a program called diversity in clinical trials and actually, actually a, high, a, a lot of the, that content is actually in the board certified medical affairs specialist program what is it you guys might know um, that the fda they put out guidance around improving diversity in clinical trials and uh, the acma actually was the first organization to develop an accredited program for that very issue because michelle brings up a really important point um, the reality is we know in clinical trials historically there was not good representation of people who had a different ethnicities and races and whatnot in terms, of, in terms of the research that we had done. So how do you improve that? And the FDA rightfully addressed this issue. So um, we do have content in there, Michelle, that focuses specifically on that because, again, this is an area that we are traditionally not trained on. So I'm glad, I'm glad that you asked that question. Another good comment that came up I see here is from Melody Davis, just not a question, but I think an important point about the fact that medical affairs teams need formalized learning teams. I think that's very, very important. A lot of times, you know, at least when I was in, in pharma and medical affairs, people want to do a one-off training. The other day we had somebody wanted to, you know, said, you know what, we want to have ACMA come in and do, you know, a, a one day training on X, Y, Z topic. But my whole thing is that's okay. But the reality is we know from, you know, good pedagogy, pedagogy and good adult learning principles that that learning needs to be reinforced constantly. So having a team in place, having something in place, again, structured framework, which requires you to go back 
and have to continuously learn and develop, I think is very, very, very important. So thanks, Melody, uh, for those comments. Um, another question that came up was, do you think compliance and other training should be made compulsory to all MSLs and medical affairs personnel? So that I, I'll give that question to Mina. I'm curious to hear what you think about that. So again, do you think compliance and other training should be made compulsory for the MSLs and medical affairs personnel? I'd love to hear Mina and maybe Pinak too. You guys, you guys can give us kind of your perspective on that. Yeah, certainly. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and, and I do think it, it should be made as part of the standard procedure as you enter uh, your role at any company, because each company varies in how they approach um, and their rules of engagement uh, on, on the compliance side. As we mentioned earlier, it's a very highly regulated environment. So you always want to know the ground rules of what you can and cannot do how much risk your company is willing to, to take on and what rules they feel are um, going to allow their people to succeed. And that differs from company to company. So I do feel, as uh, you mentioned earlier in the question that you received, Will, from a standardized learning, that has to be reinforced continuously because sometimes we get comfortable and we tend to forget or we tend to think we know the uh, correct approach um, in, in this regulatory space. Um, so that's why I truly believe one, yes, 100% um, have that baked into the, the training that you receive, continuously learn it throughout your time at an organization. Uh, and two, don't be afraid to reach out again to your compliance officers or your compliance officials at the, um, at your organization, seek their guidance, they're, they're, they're there for you. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Panak? Yeah. yeah, just a couple of things to add there. Um, yes, 100%. I think understanding the, the lines in the sand from a compliance point of view internally at a company is so vital and so important. However, I'll add to that by saying that it is, I would say it's vital for medical affairs leaders to really understand the ins and outs of compliance of the industry as a whole. And my rationale there is Sometimes, depending on what company you work for, if it's a small biotech or if it's a large big pharma, we don't always have the best practices in-house. And if you're going to employ the best practices as a medical affairs leader, you have to know what the rules of the game are from an external point of view. And that's why doing something like the ACMA is so important so that you can bring those best practices in-house, right? Even if you were to chat with your compliance folks all the time, you don't really know what kind of a background they come from. You don't know if they've done a similar training like the ACMA. I'm guessing they didn't, right? So it's so vital that you do that on your own and that you're up to date on that externally and you're keeping up with that. That's what's really going to differentiate this next generation of medical affairs leaders. I totally agree. And another question that I think is really important because we do have a lot of international folks as well. Is this applicable to other markets uh, other than the U.S.? And the answer is yes, it is. Um, so, I mean, if you're referring to board certification. So what you might not know is that um, the BCMAS program actually has different versions based on the regulatory and compliance rules and regulations for different parts of the world. So there's a BCMAS EU version. There's one for Southeast Asia. There's one for MENA region, Middle East North Africa, not this Mina. <laughs> uh, we have different parts of the of the of the world. So, um, and what we do there is we're able to recognize the users by their IP address. So, you know, if 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 Panak is dialing in or or, or, or in, enrolling, let's say in BCMAS from Germany, he would get the European version. You know, Matthews in New York, he get the U.S. version. So it's really nice. So actually, we have companies that have. Five, six hundred people in medical affairs, they, they board certify or credit through the ACMA. And what they do is they basically, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a quick one shot where they can basically get training that standardized level sets everybody. But it's actually, you know, customized for those particular parts of the world. Because obviously, you know, if you're in Canada, there's no FDA, there's a Health Canada, so forth and so on. So those things are all, you know, brought into consideration. Um Okay, Matthew, I'll bring it back to you. I just, and I apologize, I didn't mean to go kind of uh, off of the questions that you might have had, but I just want to make sure we get to some of these questions. Another good question here is, will AI replace MSLs in the future? I don't know, Afsha, what do you question. think? Yeah, that's a good one. Can you hear us, Afsha? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So will AI replace MSLs in the future? What do you think? Well, I mean, I have um, biased views about it, but um, 
As far as AI is concerned, I still think that MSLs are going to play a huge role in the future, irrespective of where AI and machine learning goes, because there's always a human touch to it, you know? I mean, I know there's a ton of information available on your uh, fingertips right now, and even in the future, it will be. But I still think MSLs are um, going to be playing a huge role and not going to be replaced by AI. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I I think that AI is great, but I think there's the that element, that human element. There's, where... yeah, there's always a human touch to it. I also yeah. see one question here, Will. It says, I'm an international pharmacist living in Canada. I want to move to the U.S. lately. I got to know about MSL and about APMA. If I don't go for pharmacy life insurance, want to come to this path. What are the scope of a person like me who has a pharmacy degree but not acquire U.S. life insurance? Is it worth it? to be a part of APMA and be an MSL. And I, I totally agree with that part. And to answer that question, uh, you do not need a pharmacy life venture for becoming a part of the program, like ECMS, or becoming a part of any other program by ACMA. And yes, it is definitely worthy to become a part of ACMA and be an MSL. Yeah, to, to be to be clear to the, for the eligibility for BCMS is to have an advanced terminal degree, so MD, PharmD, PhD, um, or if you have relevant industry experience, but there is no requirement for licensure, so that that's correct. And and there are videos made on that um, on YouTube. I have made some videos on that, so you can get a more clear insight of it there too. Yeah, thank you, Asha. Matthew? Yeah, of course. Um, <clears throat> And uh, one of the final questions I have here, um, and again, this is really for everyone, but for Will, I'll start with you. Uh, the ACMA works with over 200 pharmaceutical companies, um, but what are one or two trends that you're that you're seeing as like their primary areas of focus nowadays? And um, you know, maybe Mina or PJ or Opsha can kind of jump in after you. But like, what are like the like the primary areas of focus? Um. I would say, you know, I guess you're talking about medical affairs of capabilities. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say there's two things that I'm seeing across the board, just in general. Um, one is really trying to get better at launch. I see a lot of focus on really trying to figure out how to most optimize MSLs and medical affairs teams during that launch process, during the launch and then like right before the launch, how do you really optimize the use of those teams? The second thing I would say is probably around capabilities, you know, what we've been talking about, which is they, they want to upskill, they want them to be at that, you know, highest standard of excellence, but they're, they're not quite sure how. And Panak hit the nail on the head. You know, if you rely on what you're doing internally, we know that that typically doesn't work that well. You know, if you want an industry standard, you want to go with something that has been, is, is tried and true. And remember, with board certification, uh, we actually, develop the curriculum using data from about 185 companies. So we use that data. Data is actually what is used to guide the curriculum. They tell us where what's important for a medical affairs professional. So those KPIs are actually very much related and anchoring uh, the curriculum. I don't know if people reckon, realize that. But those should be, to me, the, the two big things, Matt. Okay. Well, that's helpful to think about. Um, does anyone else have something that they would like to add to that or maybe a, a different uh, perception on that? I, I would agree with Will. Um, I, I think launch is definitely a big one. And at each organization, uh, launch readiness and launch prep, peri launch prep and post launch prep is um, key. I think to add on to it is really everything that we discussed. And I think that the first question that came up today to Aksha was. Um, around those trends, like data analytics, everyone is trying to get better at data and harnessing the power of AI and harnessing data analytic tools, especially for, for, for data for us, for medical affairs. That's our token. That's our credibility. That's our piece of information that people can um, really build a, a trustful relationship with us. Um, so I think AI and data analytics and then um, diversity. Uh, equity and inclusion, especially in clinical study or clinical trial recruitment, um, how to be more patient centric and how to make a study more appropriate for a patient so that, for example, you're not having them drive an hour each way to just get labs or to get some imaging where they can do that local somewhere with them. So meeting the patient where they are and being mindful of the patient um, or patients in, in general 
when you're conducting a clinical study. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you know, thank you for adding that. Um, another question I saw in the chat that I think Afsha kind of uh, touched on prior, but maybe you can kind of go into more detail. Um, one that I'm seeing is like, is the BCMAS program, kind of going back to that, is that helpful for PharmDs that don't really have pharmaceutical background? Is it more so for people who have been in the industry for a long time? Could you touch a little bit more on that, Afsha? Yeah, sure. So this brings back me um, to my old point. Um, going through this program, you really don't have to be uh, somebody who's already worked in medical affairs in the pharmaceutical industry for a lot of years. It's it's a program that is designed for a newbie and also for somebody who has worked in medical affairs for so many years. And the reason I bring this point up is because it's packed with so much information that um, I, I don't think that you have to be like working in the pharmaceutical industry for years and years to get into it. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Um, then one other question I had was, I know we touched a little bit on the risk of not achieving or not overachieving in medical affairs you'd be underachieving so what are the cons like what are the consequences of not having standards in medical affairs are there like penalties associated beyond the risk of underachieving uh, is that uh you know someone could answer that i guess i can start with the most obvious answer um you will get sued <laughs> there are doj investigations that happen yes um, you know, and uh and I, I say it laughingly, but it's it's uh, it's quite a serious thing, right? Even if you are a well-intentioned, ethical medical affairs expert, um, stepping over that line once or twice, um, you know, that can easily land your organization into an investigation. They are routine. Um, you know, it's just part of the the landscape and working in pharma and biotech that you have to be aware of. So uh, that's that's my number one kind of obvious answer there. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think Panak hit the nail on the head. I think that's obviously the the biggest thing, right? But the other, the other's other, a lot of other kind of consequences, right? It's a domino effect. If you have individuals that aren't effective, you're going to end up in situations where that's going to damage relationships with your key opinion leaders, with your patient advocates. What you know, Mina just was talking about about being patient centric. You're going to have situations where it's going to slow down and make your organization less effective and less efficient. So. It, you know, by and large, in general, um, there's just a negative consequence all around. And I think, you know, in today's age and, and how competitive of a landscape we're in, no company can afford that, you know, from my perspective. Um, one, one question that we got that I think is important uh, to address, uh, Matthew, is this one from Abdel Aziz Hakami. For current product specialists at multinational pharmaceutical companies, what do you, what advice do you have for us in order to become MSLs? How do how do we strengthen our CV for the job? I thought this was important because I know you know sometimes you know this question comes up. You know our team members get this question about what you can do. I would say really when you are applying for a role, think about what the job description is emphasizing or looking for, and really try to highlight those things in the resume. That that I would say that's kind of number one. The second thing is. Um, you know, there's a statistic that 99% of people who review resumes the first time, they don't actually read them, they scan them. So you need to be able to think about the fact that if you're getting 500, you know, resumes for a position, I think the average MSL role gets 250 applicants. Uh, so if you're going through 250 applicants for an MSL role, you're probably not looking at every single resume in that much detail. You're scanning it quickly. So is, is it, scannable is it easy to read is the information laid out in a way that's visually simple for the person to pick up quickly the, the certain keywords they're looking for for that for that position that's, that's what comes to mind off the top of my head but i'd love to hear what the other panelists have to say yeah happy to take a shot um but agree with will i think uh, making making your resume just more reader friendly to your point. Like if I have to look through a hundred resumes or even 20, it's going to be really hard to do that. Um, so being skimmable is, is definitely a plus. I think also having um, a network that of, of folks that are already in the industry, already in the uh, desired role or a similar role, pick their brains, have an opportunity to reach out to them, get some coaching, some mentorship um, and get their thoughts. I think networking is, is key. 
not just in the pharmaceutical sector, but any sector um, that, that exists. Um, and, and having someone to lean on, I think, will be uh, very beneficial for you. Yeah, that was a great point. Just, just piggybacking on, on, the, on the back of that. Um, I think one key trait for MSLs specifically is the ability to synthesize data in a digestible format and deliver it effectively. Um, Will went back to that story about how salespeople get about five, 10 minutes with, with the KOL and, and you know MSLs get about an hour. That's not because we're more social, that's because we're, we're good at talking about data in a really sophisticated, elevated way. So that's a, that's a key social skill. Oh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a question here, and maybe Matthew, if you want to take this question, I'd like to know more about BCMAS, how long it is, how we get enrolled, there's a specific time like when you enroll, I guess. Um, so maybe maybe if you want to take that, it's kind of the basis. Sure. Yeah, for sure. So 20 module course, um, how long it is. I mean, if you're sitting down, not doing anything, you could probably finish it in about 25 hours, so about a you know week's time. However, people normally do it over an extended period of time. So think about 25 to 40 hours chopped up. Um, and we notice that people tend to go back and reference it even after they finish the course. So we typically will have it open for six months for individual users. Um, and then we do have a subscription plan as well for you know teams and organizations that would be a, a year of uh, you know being being enrolled, um, but yeah, it takes anywhere from 25 to 40 hours, and it's very interactive. Um, it's built on Bloom's taxonomy for those of you who are um, you know familiar with that. But it it really does take uh, information from experts all over medical affairs, um, and it, and it is updated quarterly as well. I wanted to add, um, so it's very uh, you know I think well paced. Um, some modules are longer than others, but you know, ultimately take about a little over an hour uh, on average to complete. Excellent. Um, let's see here. Probably have time for maybe one more question um, and then we can do kind of a closing here. Um, so there's been some some questions of revolving metrics and kind of like KPIs for, for MSL roles. Well, I'm not sure if you want to kind of speak to that a little bit, um, what things you've used in the past as an MSL leader um, and like how you really assess whether an M whether an M a medical affairs professional is being effective. Sure. Uh, again, I'd love to hear from the other folks on the call, being that they're kind of in the thick of it. But yeah. um, so we, we've collected data, um, you know, within our platform, ACMA Trends, it's called, where we collect data on metrics. And there's a few that come to mind. One is that's being collected now by the industry is the average number of new uh, KOL relationships established in the last 12 months. So that seems to be a big one that uh, folks are looking at. And the average number of internal presentations that are given or external presentations that are given, the number of investigator initiated studies generated in that uh, territory, uh, for example. Um, how many days the MSLs are in the field. And again, these are mostly quantitative metrics, but these are the ones that were reported back to us, the duration of the interaction with the key opinion leader. And then um, many companies are still collecting, I think it was about, at 185 companies, about 90 were still collecting data on how many interactions there were uh, with key opinion leaders over the course of a month. So those those tend to be a lot of the, again, the quantitative metrics. There's, a, of course, other qualitative metrics, but those are the ones that come to mind. Anyone else? Anyone else, yeah, anyone else have anything to add on that? Well, I, I have lots of thoughts regarding metrics, um, but, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think my, well, first of all, I think one thing that I kind of hold in high regard is what happens after these meetings. Like Will mentioned, you know, we, we put a lot of emphasis on how long, how many, what duration of presentation, et cetera, et cetera. But I really like to see what actually happens after you meet with this person. What is the output there? You know, did they change their practice? What what can we tangibly measure after yeah. your one-on-one -on -one visit? Yeah, I um, agree with you. I just want to mention this since we have a bunch of people listening. I think having an IIT as a metric for KOLs is probably bad practice because as the name suggests, it should be investigator initiated. Yeah, it, yeah. It, 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree with you. Um, it's amazing though, because but th these are the metrics that are being reported back though. You know, when we, when we through our market research and we ask companies, many are still doing that. But I mean, I absolutely agree with you. Like ultimately, even if you have, you know, X number of interactions over a month, what does it really mean in terms of moving the needle in terms of whatever the future comparative is and whatnot? So yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a whole other webinar. <laughs> <laughs> I see one. I want to be on for that. <laughs> yeah, that'll be an exciting webinar. <laughs> I love it. Does anyone else have anything kind of to add before we start uh, wrapping things up here? And I know we're towards the end of the hour. I, I think one quick thing to add was uh, yeah. piggybacking knock was what do you do with uh, what what you're getting and how do you act upon it tangibly? I think that also kind of coincides with the insights. What insights are you gathering? What is a true insight versus um, is this just a fact or is this something we kind of already knew, but it's being framed as an insight? And so yeah. I think the, the insight bringing that back home, what do you do with it internally as well as how you follow up with it externally? Is there an external approach um, that you can continue having dialogue or continuity in your relationship with? So I think yeah. that's also a metric that folks are starting to uh, refine um, at least in the last couple of years. Yeah, because the tools are out there, Bina, but I, I'm still seeing that people aren't acting on it. So they, yeah. they have the information, but it's not like part of their day to day, right? To go back and think about how they're going to utilize it. To Vinox point, like you have the, you know, I've been in these meetings where we will review, you know, quantitative metrics and then not much really happens, right? So it, I think that, again, that's a, that's a whole other issue, but I think ultimately, it's something that the medical affairs function as a whole still kind of struggles with a little bit, um, for sure. Um, all right, so I think probably we're at time, right, Matthew? Yep, yep, we're, we're right at time. Um, I just want to, you know, obviously thank my speakers for today. Um, thank you for all your insights and answering all the questions today. Um,